Hello everybody and welcome to my second of two videos on this, the Canon Original F1. In the first video we talked about what everything is, and in this video we're going to talk about how to use all of the things we didn't cover already, and how they affect your photography. We're going to start right here with the battery chamber, because the, the battery only powers the light meter, but we're just going to cover this right up front because a lot of people ask me about this. I made the first set of videos on this camera 10 years ago, and I still get questions from people about battery options. So to open the battery chamber we're just going to grab a coin and we're going to hopefully, there we go, get this battery chamber open. Now you're going to notice I'm using the wrong kind of battery in here and we'll cover that in a second. Here is your battery chamber co cover, okay? And you can see the markings on your battery chamber cover right there. They show the, the, type, the, the shape of the battery and the direction to put it in. Basically, you want the positive terminal to contact the battery cap and the negative terminal to co contact the inside of the battery chamber. So here I have a battery inside of a brass adapter. I'm going to pop that out really quickly. And this is what the inside of a properly clean battery chamber should look like. It should not have any kind of uh, white exploded battery stuff in it. If your battery has exploded and it's an alkaline battery and there's some white or potentially green um, like looks kind of like minerally gunk inside of it, you can neutralize that with distilled white vinegar and then clean out the bed on, on a cotton swab. You don't want to pour that in there but put it, put it on a cotton swab and then clean it out until everything stops foaming and then after you're done with the vinegar grab some some isopropyl alcohol on a cotton swab again never pour anything into your camera and then you can clean up the threads and the contacts and maybe uh, your battery will you'll, you'll be able to use a battery again battery corrosion can ruin the contacts inside of the camera for the light meter but it's worth trying to save it all right let's talk about battery options for this camera because this originally took the mercury powered 1.35 volt batteries which are not made anymore so if you were just to take a standard brass adapter like this one and a Duracell or other make uh, LR44, A76, 357, AG13 battery, this would have too much voltage and your light meter would underexpose your images by two stops. So you don't want that to happen. Uh, you have two options. You can grab a simple brass adapter like this. They're not that expensive. You can grab them off eBay and use 675 style batteries like this. These are hearing aid batteries, and that will give you a proper meter reading. This is the least expensive and easiest way to, to use batteries with this camera, 675 and a brass adapter. You could also use AG13s if you have one of these voltage adapting adapters like this that you use with it, which pulls the, the voltage down to 1.35 coming out of it and gives you proper metering. The 675s are 1.4, and that's close enough for this light meter. So if you have this, then you can use an AG13, but these are spendy, and if you lose one, you have to buy a new one. Brass adapters are not spendy. You can buy like a dozen of them at once, and if you lose one, eh, just go grab another one. So, um, there's another option. Uh, I have modified the inside of my camera, and it's not hard to do, but it's also not the easiest camera I've done this on, with a diode so that it can take modern batteries. That's why I have an AG13 inside of this brass adapter, because I've modified the circuitry on this camera to take a modern battery. If I had a 650, which I don't right now, I could use that as well, and a 650 it's the same size and shape as the original batteries this was supposed to take, but it's way too many volts. Uh, it's the 1.5 volts like the AG13. So if you just used a 650 battery in this, then you would have two stops of underexposure on every one of your photos. There's another thing you can do, which is grab that, that brass adapter and the AG13 or the 650 and pop it in there, and then calibrate your light, your light meter setting against the Sunny 16 rule and trick your camera into giving you the proper meter reading. What that means is you go outside on a sunny day with the sun to your back and you find something that's a middle gray color, say like the sidewalk or a, a bush, right? And you take a meter reading off of that and you know that at f16 with 400 ISO film, your shutter speed should be somewhere in the 250 to 500 range. 
Then you just adjust the ASA dial, which we'll see in a minute when we load film, until your meter reading gives you a proper meter reading, your light meter inside your viewfinder, and then you've tricked your camera into giving you a proper meter reading with the wrong voltage battery. Alkaline battery voltage does change over the life of the battery, so you would need to do that every now and then, not every roll, but maybe every once a month, give or take, until the battery is dead. So those are your battery options for this camera. There are a few different ways to go about it. I will say that if you have the technical know-how to modify the circuitry, it is worth doing. The one caution I'd give you is that these, the, um, the wiring that you have to use that you can access in the bottom of the camera to do that is very short. And I almost lost the wiring into the camera's body when I did that, that modification. So it is not something I would recommend unless you are very comfortable working in small spaces with small components. Now to get the battery cap back on, you just put it in place. And because of these ridges around the outside, you can get it pretty well in place and then just finish it off with your coin, or you can actually use the wide part of a key here. If your battery chamber doesn't thread easily, back it back out and try again. You don't want to cross thread this because that can ruin either the base plate or your battery cap and cause you to have to buy a new one. This should thread on very easily. A cross threaded battery cap can be a real pain to get off and then to have to replace later. Okay, so we've just put a battery in. It's time to check it and make sure that it's going to work. First thing to do is set your ISO to 100 and then your shutter speed to 1 2,000th. And we're going to rotate the dial here into the check position just like that. When you do that, here's a close-up that we're going to see in a bit, again, of your viewfinder. There's a little block down in the bottom of your viewfinder here. This black needle will rest around this viewfind, this block. If it's a little bit above in the, in the block, you're just fine. If it's below, then your battery is weak or vice versa. I'm forgetting which right now. And I didn't write down in my notes which way it goes, so I'm going off memory on that. Um, at any rate, that's how you check your battery, and that line should be in, in or around that black box. I believe it, uh, if, you, if you check your battery and, the, and the, the, the black needle goes all the way to the top in the red, that means you probably forgot to set your shutter speed to 1 2,000th or your ISO to 100. The next thing we're going to cover is how to mount and unmount lenses from this camera. Now this camera, as I mentioned in the first video, can take FD, FDN, and FL lenses, all three. I don't have an FL lens, but it mounts the same way as an FD, so we'll see how to do that in just a minute. To remove an FDN lens from this camera, we're going to find the silver button on the side here and push it down. Rotate counter or anti-clockwise until the red dot is at the top. Pull off the red dot and now we've removed the lens. To mount an FDN lens, we, take, we look for this red dot, make sure that the red dot on the inside is lined up with the red dot on the ring. We find the red dot here at the top, drop it in place, and turn it until it clicks. And now we've successfully mounted an FDN lens. To mount an FD lens, which is the older style with the silver ring, we're gonna pop the, bat, the, the lens cap off, we want to make sure that this index here for the distance lines up with the red dot on the silver ring. We're going to drop this into place so that the red dots align. And then we just turn the silver ring clockwise until we can't turn it anymore. There's no click with the FD lenses. The FL lenses mount in the exact same manner as the FD lens. The difference with the FL lenses is they have the aperture ring up front, not at the back. To remove an F FD or FL lens, we simply turn the silver ring counterclockwise until the red dots align and we can easily take the lens off and now we can grab a different lens and put that on and we're good to keep going. So next thing I want to talk about is how to use an FL lens with stop down metering. We're going to have to play a little bit of make believe and pretend that this FDN lens is an FL lens. With the FL lenses what you would do is set the aperture to whatever you want it to be. I've got it set at f8 and then you push this lever inside and that will shut down the aperture to your selected setting and now you can take a meter reading dial in your shutter speed and take your photo just like that when you're done with your reading 
just push the bottom lever in and that will open and unlock your depth of field app preview. So while we are here looking at the depth of field preview button, this whole front assembly, let's talk about how to use this. First thing we're going to do is the self timer. If we turn this counterclockwise until it stops, that activates the self timer. This is going to count down and when the count is finished, then it's going to trigger the shutter at our selected shutter speed. If you use bulb, it's just going to trigger the shutter. Bulb is not compatible with self timers. So we saw a little bit stop down metering, push it in to close the aperture, push that button to unlock it. If we just leave this here, then we get depth of field preview. And as soon as we release this lever, the aperture opens back up. So that makes that pretty nice and easy to use. What about mirror lockup? If we push the depth of field preview, the, the stop down metering button in, and then we rotate this lower switch to M, we've now locked up the mirror. What's that mean? Let's find out. I'm going to remove the lens. We're going to push that in so that the aperture will stop down. And now we're going to slide this lever over to M and the mirror is locked up. This way, if we're doing something like macro work or microscopy where image shake is very noticeable or star trails where we don't want to have that very beginning of the star trails have a shake, we can just simply set this to mirror lockup. There is one downside to this, this style. We don't have a self timer like this. So we'll close that again. We'll set this over to the self timer. And as you can see, we cannot use the self timer with the self with the mirror lockup in combination. So it's one or the other. It's not the end of the world, but self timer and mirror lockup are a good thing to have in concert. A workaround for that is to use mirror lockup and then have a self timer that screws into your shutter release up here, and then you get self timer and mirror lockup, just not built into the camera. Advance the film prior to mounting the lens. And by the way, just as a reminder, if you can see that, because I forgot to say it when I when I did the lens cut bit, if you see that red dot there, don't mount your lens, you will break things. Next thing that we're going to do is load film into the original Canon F1. To load film, we're going to push the silver button on the front of the film rewind knob down, lift up the film rewind knob, and now we can open the back of the camera. We're going to grab our roll of 35 millimeter film and drop it into the film cassette area, just like that, and push the film rewind knob post back into place. Now this is locked in. Pull out a leader, slide it into this take up spool, and just hook that leader onto the uh, spool. Hold our finger right there. Did not like the way that went. Let's try that again. Gonna slide that leader into that slot a little bit further this time. A little bit further. There we go. We can hold our fingers over the sprocket holes and advance the film. And as you can see, the film is taken up in the same direction as the curl of the film, which I always like. Now we've loaded the film. When the film rests flat like this inside of the camera, as you can see there it's resting flat, you are safe to close the camera back. Next thing we're going to do before we forget is we're going to make sure that the ASA is set to our film's ISO. So I've got 400 in there, so I'm good to go. But if I was saying using, using 1600, I'd have to adjust that. Or if I had loaded it up with 50 ISO, I'd have to adjust that to 50. So just make sure that the ASA reading on your camera matches the ISO of your film. We'll take a couple of rolls, a couple of shots here. And when we're on frame one, Right there, we're ready to go. Now I'm going to take a little bit of slack out of the film with the film rewind knob. You don't want to push it back past the point where you get resistance, but I want to show you how the film rewind knob here reacts when I advance the film. You can see the film rewind knob advances as the film is taken up through the camera. And that's because there's a mechanical connection between the film rewind knob and the film take-up spool. So as the film moves through the back of the camera, 
gets pulled out of the cassette and taken up, and that's how you can advance the film through the camera to take photos with a fresh bit of film every time you take a photo. To that end, film is one and done. Film can record light a single time with a proper aperture, shutter speed, and uh, lighting for your selected film or all of that for your available lighting. Or it can record every photon that reaches it until it maxes out in an uncontrolled manner by doing something rather like this. If you open up your film back while you have film in the camera like this, everything that is outside of the cassette will be ruined. Every photo you have taken will be erased. Every photo you could have taken will be erased. So make sure that when you use this camera, you keep the film back closed until you have completely used all of your film and then rewound it back into the cassette. But I want you to see how film works as it goes through the camera. So you take your picture. I'm gonna put my thumb here to hold the cassette in place like the film back would do or the film door and then advance the film. And you can see these marks here show how much the film advances when you take a photo. So your shutter's right about here, you take a photo, the image is recorded here, and then you advance, and then the fresh film moves in front of the shutter. The film that has just been used moves past the shutter and over onto the side here. There you go. Now when you go to rewind the film, I'm gonna hold the film rewind button down, and oh, if you let go of the film rewind button, it, it will stop. So you just keep holding it down until you've rewound the film all the way. So at this point, when you've rewound the film completely into the cassette, now you can open up the film door and you can remove your cassette. We'll push the silver unlock button, pull out the film post, I'll grab my cassette. If you're gonna take another roll of film, drop the cassette in here. When you're using film, it's always a good idea to completely rewind the cassette the film into the cassette. This way you won't accidentally use it a second time and get double exposures on the film. And then if you're done shooting for the day, just make sure to trigger your shutter before you put your camera away and you're good to go. Next thing let's talk about is how to use a flash with this camera. So, so like I said, I don't have the adapter that fits right here that would allow me to actually show you how to mount a flash to this camera. So just imagine a little thing going over this, over the film rewind knob. And when, when it's there, you can plug a flash into the camera and it can rest over here. As you can see, it's probably not gonna work with the sport finder. Anyway, another option you have is you can grab a PC cable and a PC cable just plugs right into your PC port here. Now, PC does not mean personal computer. It stands for Prontor Comper, which were um, two shutter makers, old leaf shutters back decades and decades before this camera was made. And they decided to get together and have this standard flash connection on their shutters. And it's still the standard today, by the way. So for simple flash connection. So this is, this is how the PC port connects our PC cable connects to the PC port, and then some flashes, this is not one of them, you plug the other end of the cable into the flash, and that's how you trigger it. And with a PC cable like that, one thing you can do is grab something called a flash bar. And a flash bar just looks like this. You've got a tripod socket over here that screws into your camera, and another one over here, and that you get an adapter for your flash, and you can screw this, the flash, into this other one. Then what you can do is you can have your flash off to the side of your camera. Fair question. Why does it matter where your flash is? Why not just put it right here? The worst possible place to have a flash is right on top of your camera. So if you imagine you've got your flash mounted like this, the, flash, the light from your flash leaves the flash, moves to your subject, bounces off of them, and comes back to your lens. And that will come back because it's left in a flat burst, making your subjects look very flat, and if you're using color film, it will almost certainly give them red eye. Nothing about having a flash on top here is flattering to your subjects. So there are a couple things you can do. You can get a flash like this, and you can articulate it. So you can bounce the light off of the ceiling, or you can get one that also swivels and bounce it off the wall, or the wall and the ceiling like that. But uh, back in the day, this is much less common now, there were a lot of flashes that were stuck pointing forward like this. Well, if you had that flash bar, you could mount this off to the side, shoot in portrait orientation, and now you have a bounce flash off of the ceiling 
or shoot in landscape orientation, and now you have a bounce flash off the wall. And that would give you a lot of control over your flash. You can also plug in things like RF triggers or just have a really long cable, and you can hand hold your flash and really sculpt the light exactly how you want. So if you're gonna use a flash and you're new to it, the, the most important takeaway is mounting it on top of your camera is the worst place you can mount it. Mounting it off to the side gives you a lot more variability. Hand holding your flash or mounting it way, way uh, away from your camera gives you even more control. And one of the things that you want to do is use your flash to mimic the way that it's going that, that light flatters our subjects. If you think about the way that we see our subjects, people or anything, we see them in a similar fashion where they are lit from above. If we're outside, the sun or the moon at night will light us from above. Same thing with street lights if we're in the city. If we're indoors, lights are generally above us. So our brains are used to seeing people lit from above and we see people lit from above as being lit in a flattering manner. That's why old film noir movies would light villains from below, the exact opposite of lighting from above. So if you can use your, your flash to have your light leave the flash, bounce off the ceiling, reach your subject, and then bounce back to your camera, the light from your flash will replicate the directionality of light that we're used to seeing, and it will set your subjects up to be more flattered by the light that you're, you're creating for your images. Next thing we're going to do is talk about how to change the prism and the focusing screens on this camera. Changing the prism is pretty easy. We're going to push the silver button here on the bottom, and then we just slide it backwards until the prism comes off. Now we can grab a different prism and put it on, or if we only took this prism off to give it a good cleaning, we can do that. You can see inside of the camera here we have the focusing screen. Focusing screens are very easy to remove. Simply use your fingernail to lift the back of the focusing screen up and pull it out of the camera like that. And we've removed the focusing screen. The focusing screen will tell you on the front of it which, which model it is. This is the D, the grid focusing screen. Now you can see in there we've got no focusing screen and no prism. If you have some dirt in there, it's a good idea to clean it out if you want to. Or you can clean off your focusing screen. I can't believe I just set that down like that. Well, it's kind of protected. Okay. To put your focusing screen back in, all we have to do is put it up at the front of the, the camera. We don't slide it in. This part of the screen is very fragile. If you just slide it in, you could scratch it on this and ruin your screen. So we're gonna take it up to the front of the camera, angle it in like this. There's a little catch there that it's gotta go under, and then push it gently, there we go, into place, just like that. When you put it in place, now it's properly aligned. We're gonna grab our focusing prism and it goes back on in exactly the opposite manner of how we took it off. There's, these are basically rails right here and the focusing prism has these, uh, well, these are tracks and this is, uh, there's not tracks and wheels. Anyway, this single piece on the prism fits into this, this guide rail right here. We just line it up, push it in until we hear a faint click, just give it a little tug to make sure that it locked in place and we've changed the prism and the focusing screen. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is talk about how, what's in your viewfinder and how to take a light meter reading with this camera. Okay, so this is what you're gonna see when you look through your viewfinder. This is your focusing area and your focusing screen, whether you have a split prism or something else, this is what you'll see here. This is your shutter speed. And this is your light meter window. Your light meter, as we're gonna see in better detail in just a moment, has a few components. A circle, a horizontal line, dark red, dark red, your battery check box here. If your needle is in the, the dark red down here, under exposure, here are two examples of a proper exposure with this camera. The needle is in the middle of the circle. It doesn't matter where on the bar it is, as long as the needle is in the middle of the circle, you have a proper exposure. Basically, the, the circle is your aperture indicator and your needle is your lighting and shutter speed indicator. So if you adjust your aperture, the circle is gonna move up and down. If you adjust your light or your shutter speed, the needle will move up and down. So your goal is to get them lined up. If your meter looks like this, you have significant underexposure. 
your aperture is shut too far for your lighting and your shutter speed. So if you want to correct this, either open up your aperture or give yourself a slower shutter speed. Over here you have significant overexposure. Your aperture is way too wide for your lighting and shutter speed. So either shut your aperture a little bit or make, give yourself a faster shutter speed or less light. Your goal is to make sure that the, the needle is in the middle of the circle somewhere on this meter. So having seen all of that, let's talk about how to take a picture with this camera. It's really very easy. You'll have your film loaded, you'll have your battery in, you'll take your, your, turn your meter on, you'll take your meter reading, and you'll adjust the shutter speed and the aperture as needed to get the, the needle in the circle lined up. And then at that point, all you have to do is focus on the subject you want and take the picture. It's that simple. Okay, really simple. All you have to do is take, to, is take the picture once you have your settings dialed in and just make sure that the settings you dial in are ones you're comfortable with. Okay, great. What about double exposures? Can they be done? They can. Let me show you how. So first thing we're going to do is talk about the mechanics of the double exposure and then we're going to talk about the science of it. So to take a double exposure, take your first photo, hold down the film rewind knob and lever like this, hold down the film rewind button on the bottom of the camera and advance the film. And what this does is this rearms the shutter but disengages the film advance gearing inside of it so that you can rearm the shutter without the film advancing and that allows the film to stay in place while the shutter is rearmed and you can take your second photo, which you do like that. Okay, then you advance the film and you move on to your next shot, right? No. Next thing that you want to do is take what's called a dead frame because when you disengage the gearing, it doesn't necessarily start up right away. So as you advance the film, your, your double exposure might only move part way through the camera. And then your next frame is going to be right here, and when you take your photo, that's going to ov partially overlap your double exposure, and it could potentially ruin both images. So what you do is you set your aperture to the smallest setting, you set your shutter speed to 1 2,000th, you put your lens cap on, or if you don't have one, you set this up against your leg, take your photo, and now you advance again, and you can go on and take your next real photo, because you know that the double exposure will have advanced past the shutter area. Okay, so that's the mechanics. What's the science? Well, film is engineered to take a certain number of photons and create an image. So let's assume that 1 1 25th of a second at f5.6 is a proper single exposure. If you take two frames at that setting in the same part of the film, you're going to hit the film with twice as many photons as it's designed to have. The end result is going to be what's called a thick dark or dense negative. Those are three words that mean the same thing. Your film had too many photons. The result of that is that in digital scanning, your images will have a lot of noise and you will lose contrast. In darkroom printing, your images will take a lot longer to print and you will lose contrast. So you want to try to get your exposure as close to possible, as close to correct as possible in your double exposure. So everything we're dealing with is fractions. There are two ways to adjust your settings. The first is that if you're using 1 1 25th and five, f5.6 five, and you're going to take two, two frames for a double exposure, you need to cut the amount of ha light reaching your film in half. There's a very simple way to do that. 1 2 50th of a second is half as much time as 1 1 25th. Half as much time, half as much light. Okay, that's pretty easy. But but let's say you were doing a double exposure where it was really long and it was going to be a one second double exposure so you could capture the motion of a waterfall. Okay, so we're set on having that one second for, for each of the two frames. You can go down here to F5.6, cut the amount of light in half. F8 is a stop smaller than F6, half as much light. So switching this one stop to F8 will cut the amount of light in half. You do the, your whole film advance process, take your second exposure, you've taken a successful double exposure. So there are two ways to adjust your camera to cut the light reaching the film in half, with your shutter speed 
or with your aperture. And which one you choose is up to you based on how you want your image to look. And that is it. That is everything to go over with the Canon Original F1. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next camera manual video.